Before we get started, I just wanted to take about three seconds to have a moment of silence for the Patriots fans who will experience a great loss this weekend. <clears throat> okay, I can see that you all can't follow instructions, so. But seriously, uh, welcome to our talk on excellent board uh, governance. I'm very humbled to be joined by three dynamic leaders and thinkers who bring a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, to this discussion. Uh, to my left, we have Tanetta McIntosh, who is the Managing Director and Head of Firmwide and Corporate Employee Communications at J.P. Morgan Chase, and also is the Chair of the, the uh, Sphinx Organization Board. To her left, we have Ann Parsons, who is the president and CEO of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. And to Ann's left, at the end of the table, we have Mr. Michael Kaiser, who is the chairman of the DeVos Institute of Arts Management. My name is Stanford Thompson, and I am the founder and executive director of Play on Philly and proud member of the uh, Sphinx family. You can read. All of our full bios in the printed programs are also online on the Sphinx Connect website. Um, but one thing as we get uh, started and to really frame this conversation, that this panel will not tackle a comprehensive guide on board governance, but rather focus on the board as a living organism governing a complex system of relationships. Now, the first board of directors I engaged with was my parents who governed a house of eight kids with limited finite resources. So there were tough decisions that were made frequently. I often had to surrender to what was best for the family unit. There was a strong sense of strict uh, discipline that really ensured order with all 10 of us in this home. Uh, chaos, in a way, was squashed with a sense of shared struggle. And the tough love environment my parents created gave each of my siblings a chance to excel in very unique ways. Um, they taught us a lot about hard work and excellence, and that was always expected in everything that we pursued. But it was our values, communication, and flexibility that was the foundation for our ecosystem to thrive. There was a reason why we went to church every Sunday. Uh, there's a reason why we met around the dinner table each night. And as we grew older, we were expected to take on more and more individual responsibility for our actions and thus the direction that our lives have all taken. So this is exactly what we will focus on in this conversation, how our values, communication, and flexibility is the foundation and the fuel that our organizations need to thrive in a challenging, but a very, very exciting time of today. So uh, I wanted to start and have uh, everybody uh, share a, a story with all of us here. Um, and Michael, I'd like to start with you first, um, really building upon your experience with the Alvin Ailey Dance Company and how you know, the relationship of the, the board and the changes um, that you know, took place or maybe should have taken place over the years while you were there. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I became executive director of the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater in 1991. Alvin had passed away about a year before. Judith Jamison was our wonderful artistic director at the time. Um, but we were bankrupt, virtually, um, not legally yet. And our, our board had 36 members on it. Um, and what I soon learned after being there was that 18 of my 36 board members had been on the board for at least 25 years. Um, they were wonderful people who were passionate about our organization, totally supportive of our dancers, could tell you every role that every dancer had ever danced. Um, but that's, their, that's what they knew and that's what they brought to board meetings. Um, they didn't really they hadn't grown as the organization had grown. At that point, Alvin Ailey was already the largest modern dance organization in the world. Uh, we had a budget of six and a half million dollars, but 18 of my 36 board members combined could contribute $5,000. Um, 
which was a challenge. And I don't believe every board member needs to give or needs to give the same amount. I'm not a big believer in regimentation that way. But when half your board can provide $5,000 on a $6.5 million budget, it's not surprising that you're facing some financial challenges. So, um, what I learned from, I learned three things from this time. The first was that boards do need to evolve the exact same way as staffs need to evolve. And as organizations grow, when an organization starts, it might be an artist and a friend or a mother who helps put the organization together. And your board are essentially your staff. They are your friends, your parents, your family who help do the work that needs to be done, the bookkeeping, the marketing, et cetera. But as an organization grows and builds a fairly sizable size and staff and budget, the board needs to evolve as well. And for a lot of arts organizations, I find the staff evolves and the board doesn't. And many of the organizations I consult with that are facing challenges, those challenges relate to a board that has stayed static for so long that really over time, the board does not fulfill the true need for governance that the organization has. The second thing I learned was that this board because they had started as the people who sewed costumes and drove the dancers to performances, et cetera, um, never really learned or thought it was their role to do any fundraising. And while that's not the only job of a board, it is one job of a board. And um, when I was interviewed even, and, and after I started, my board had one mantra, ask Bill Cosby for a million dollars. That was their solution to our <laughs> bankruptcy. And number one, Bill Cosby was not going to give a million dollars when the average board gift was under a thousand dollars. And number two, what I learned was that when you say things like ask Bill Cosby for a million dollars, what everyone on my board was hearing was, if I don't know someone who can give a million dollars, I shouldn't help with fundraising. And since no one on my board knew anyone who could give a million dollars, they all felt it wasn't their job and that was someone else's responsibility. So I learned that we very quickly had to change the language and that we had to talk about contributions at a much more reasonable level. And then the third thing I learned um, from this experience was that it's my job as a staff person, even though my board loves the company and is obligated to help, it is still my job to inspire them. I met with all 36 of my board members one by one, and I said to them, who do you know who can help us raise money? I'll do the work, just give me some names. And the astonishing thing was not one of my board members had ever met another human being. And they knew not one person <laughs> who could help the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. Um, and they felt our fame was gonna carry us, that we're Alvin Ailey, we travel the earth. Everyone knows Alvin Ailey, that will give us money. They were surprised we didn't have much more money. And then shortly after I arrived, the author Alex Haley died. You know Alex Haley is the author of the book Roots. And we got thousands of letters of condolence because people thought Alex Haley was Alvin Ailey. <laughs> and that told me that we were not quite as famous as we thought we were. And so the third thing I learned was that I had to create a institutional marketing program that got people truly excited about who we were, what we did, to know that we didn't write roots, and that correspondingly excited my board members and made them less embarrassed about our financial health and much more excited about who we were, what we were doing, and our place in the community. So again, these th just to recap the three things I learned. One, our boards need to evolve as our organizations grow and change. Number two, we have to be very careful with the words we use when we discuss things like fundraising because we can actually convince people they're not going to be helpful. And number three, we have to inspire and excite our board members in order for them to feel really happy and about helping us in the ways we need help. Thank Great, you. thanks Michael. We'll come back, we'll unpack some of these things in a moment, but I wanna turn it over to Anne uh, to talk with us a little bit about the impact of the Great Re Recession uh, here in Detroit and how that influenced the decisions you know, the board needed to make, I think, in some really difficult times. Thank you, and I'm uh, honored to be with all of you today. Um, I am not the board member in the room, um, although I sit on several boards, and, um, but I'm very fascinated and committed to the topic of governance and good governance, and I think it's a journey that we are all always on, so I'm thrilled to be here and learn from, from people on both sides of me. Um, 
be, and being asked to talk about the history of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra's difficult times, which um, go back to 2008. Um, I started in 2004, and I joined an organization that was very aspirational and doing amazing work in the field of orchestras, had just opened a beautiful center, which you will all see if you haven't already, that has education focus and is a community center, and this was in 2003, this vision that the Detroit Symphony Orchestra had. I joined this organization with great enthusiasm, and um, I was charged with trying to pull it together, and there were lots of frayed edges around finances and around connection to community and a community that was, was struggling. And, uh, but, the, the, but as an anchor organization, the arts organizations in this town fit an anchor role, and that it goes to every issue that the city has, and that was, again, the thing that attracted me. So we actually balanced our budget uh, for several years once I got there, and um, even though there had been some financial struggles, and I credit the amazing board of directors for doing that heavy lifting. They were a fundraising board to a person um, contributing personally and connecting with others. And so we were very lucky to be uh, eligible for a, a very large grant at the time, a million dollar gift, and as part of that gift, we were asked to open our books and show, um, answer any questions, and we were very happy to do that. Um, we were very enthusiastic, and so when we got the 40-page report, um, I'm gonna read you something from page four and something from page 40. The summary. The DSO has lost increasingly large amounts over the last five years, which it has funded with a variety of one-time fixes, including extraordinary draws from its endowment. With a structural deficit of six to seven million dollars, which, which has only become apparent in the last two years, the underlying business model can now be seen as untenable. The size of the deficits means a fundamental restructuring will have to take place to bring expenses into balance with sustainable revenues. With an illiquid balance sheet and negative cash flows, the DSO has little time before it must take action. Right? That's page four. It gets better. <laughs> the conclusion, um, very top, and uh, there's lots of other things I could read to you. It's, it's amazing for me to go back and read this again. 2008, the DSO needs to confront its financial reality. Board and staff must make decisions based on the facts rather than their hopes. And we always add and dreams, even though he didn't write that word. But we were, in fact, and I'm going to stop reading, um, we were living on hopes and dreams. We had vision um, beyond what was maybe practical. We had people who were on the board. We had a 100-person board with the most amazing leaders in this town pulling for us. So um, my story which uh, lived out in the press, but not in 2008, not until 2010 did it live out in the press, um, was a story about the board confronting reality. And the staff, me, and later my friend Paul Hogel, and many, some people who are in this room who worked at the DSO during this time, we were heartbroken over the news that we had to fundamentally change. Who likes to change? But we were also completely committed to pulling through and to finding a way to save the Detroit Symphony Orchestra for the, for the city of Detroit, for the community, for the citizens, for the history, for everybody. And um, I think that this was the most amazing time for a board to go through, certainly for a staff to go through, and obviously um, the most painful part of it ultimately was for the orchestra. And the board did not bury this report the board did not publish this report, but they did not bury it. And um, this was not the only report of its kind being written in that time in this town, I will simply say. And we had meetings, we had town hall meetings, we had small meetings, we had larger meetings. We tried to push through these very hard times by facing the reality, having tough, honest, sometimes ugly, very complex conversations. No less than five consultants later, 
all telling us more or less the same thing, <laughs> and a six-month strike, and a complete restructuring of our debt, did we come through a period of major, major deficits, and starting in 2000, well, we're in our fifth year of a break-even budget, so we can go back from there. There was this difficult time, thank you. Um, I, this is a board conversation. This is not the history of the DSO and the story of the DSO. This is a conversation around board and governance. And it is thanks to the determination and the fearlessness of our board to um, listen as well as ask the right questions of as many smart people as we could find and really invest in the change we needed to, to live in order to serve and survive and excel. And some of us say it's one of the best times we've been through, even though it was the worst time. Um, and we became, um, while the staff restructured many times, the, bo the, the orchestra's scope and scale of work changed dramatically. Um, the board went through a complete restructure and reimagining, and we went from a 100-person board to a small board of directors, a larger board of trustees, so more or less 25 and 75, and then a governing member group, which can be as big as, as, as our dreams and our vision will hold, at the moment nearly 500 people, and they elect the board of directors. And so out of this difficult time, the story, the, the moral of the story is you grab those times and you face reality. And if your board is with you, there is nothing that you can't do or you can do anything. And we will get to the culture piece in a minute, but the very last thing we realized was that the thing that needed to change more than anything at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra was its culture. So we'll get to that later. Thank you. And <clears throat> Uh, Tanetta, I know that uh, you have been the, uh, elected the chair for just a couple of months of the uh, Sphinx organization and served on the board for some time. Um, but I'm really curious for you to reach into your corporate background, um, considering that you have to communicate um, things from the board and from uh, the leaders of J.P. Morgan um, uh, to a large group of people. Um, so I'm just curious if you can unpack uh, what that looks like for us. I sure can. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here uh, with Anne and Michael. And I feel like a bit of an outlier because they've had such illustrious careers with these arts organizations. And I've basically spent my entire uh, professional career uh, in corporate America, working for J.P. Morgan Chase, 24 years now. Um, and, and so I'm going to come at it from a bit of a different angle. Um, as Stanford said, I am the chair of Sphinx, so thank you all so much for being here this afternoon um, and supporting Sphinx Connect. I hope you're really enjoying it. Um, I am the chair of the board. I was elected in December, so I, this is month two. Um, I have been on the board for three years now. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to tell a story. I'm going to set up a story, and then I'll come back and tell you how we, how we tackled it. Um, and, and hopefully give you all some tangible, um, useful tips on how you can think about communicating during crisis, times of crisis. Um, a lot of what Anne talked about really resonated and tie, ties in quite nicely to um, some of what I'm gonna talk about. But let's start at the beginning. So I'm gonna take you back to a much simpler, simpler time. Picture January 2004. There was no Facebook. Facebook was just coming online. There was no Instagram, there was no Snapchat, and the only thing that was tweeting were birds. Um, so, so you were um, in a position as a communicator to have greater control over your narrative, and, and so it was simpler, it was an easier time. Um, 2004 January, our board, our leadership announced that we were going to merge with Bank One. Uh, so just to give you a little background, J.P. Morgan Chase was a uh, fairly large organization, about 90,000 employees around the world. We had an investment bank. We also had a large retail presence on the East Coast. We were headquartered in New York. Bank One was a somewhat smaller organization headquartered in the Midwest um, with only a retail presence. And when it was announced, there was just, I would say, a, a feeling of panic that um, went through the organization, especially on the J.P. Morgan Chase side. 
And there were three reasons for that. One was because we announced it as a merger, but in fact, J.P. Morgan Chase was purchasing Bank One. And so no one, no one felt really great about that, about calling it a merger, because that meant that the folks on the, you know, the J.P. Morgan Chase side were now equals with Bank One. And, you know, employees don't want to, you know, they want to feel like they're in a position of power or strength. So that was number one. Number two was that they announced that they were going to move the headquarters from New York to Chicago, which is where Bank One was headquartered. And the third thing was that most of the senior leadership that was now going to run the retail organization was going to consist of Bank One leaders, not J.P. Morgan Chase leaders. So as you might imagine, there was a lot of concern um, around the announcement. And what I was charged with um, from our leadership was to work with my Bank One counterpart and figure out how best to strategically communicate to our employees why this transaction was actually a good deal for the company um, and hopefully a good deal for most of them. Um, and, and not to put too fine a point on it, but I had just moved from the Virgin Islands two years prior to this and I had been a member of a larger communications team and I watched after the announcement one by one each person leave the company or look for a new job or you know jump ship until it was just me. I was the only one left. And so I had to put my personal fears and feelings <laughs> aside and really develop a strategy and work very closely with my counterpart um, on coming up with a strategy that would keep employees focused on the matter of the merger um, and not on you know their own sort of personal what am I what am I going to do? What is my role going to be? Who's going who's gonna, who's gonna to lead the company? Um, <coughs> type of questions. So we did, uh, we did six things, and um, I will quickly tell you what they were now, and then I'll come back and tell you what I think some of the lessons learned were and what you, know, what you all can think about if, if you run into a situation where you have something very large that you need to con communicate to your constituents. So the first thing, and these are all very tangible, uh, practical things. The first thing we did was we set up a website for our employees, and we updated it sometimes as frequently as three or four times a day. Um, employees knew that that's where they could go. That should be their first port of call to get um, answers to questions that they might have. And as we got answers, we were posting those answers. Um, the second thing we did was we got our managers um, FAQs and talking points. Very important to make sure that the folks that are leading these teams understood what was happening so that they could also answer the questions of all of their employees. Uh, the third thing we did was we produced a biweekly newsletter, and that was emailed out to employees. So if they weren't going to the website, they were getting an email, and we tried to tailor those newsletters to their functions so that they weren't, they weren't getting a broad swath of information. They were getting information that was really specific for them. One of the most important things we did was we got our CEOs out on the road. Um, so so the, the CEO in the end was Jamie Dimon. You've, you all have probably heard of him. Um, the great thing about Jamie is that he, he is very down to earth, he speaks his mind, whether you like his answer or not, you're going to get the unvarnished truth. And so we got him out on the road and he basically said, ask me anything and I will give you the best answer that I have. You might not like it, but at least you'll know. Um, and so we got him out on the road and that was extremely helpful. Uh, the fifth thing we did was we looked for our ambassadors. Today they're probably called influencers. Um, we still call them ambassadors. Who are those people in the company that people look up to, respect? Um, who can we use to tell our story? And we, you know, armed those people with facts and information as well, got them on the road, um, and also got them on the road externally, talking to, um, you know, external constituents, um, government, you know, people in government, community leaders, et cetera. Um, and then the sixth thing we did is we worked on our culture. And, and I think you're going to talk a little bit about this. But culture was really important. And we made it really clear very early on what behaviors we were expecting of our employees to exhibit. Because that was the only way we would get through the merger successfully. Um, and so we made it really clear that whether they thought the transaction was good or bad, that they were expected to work well with their counterparts at the other company. That they were not to hold information back. That they were to create open, transparent, um, lines of communication and, and work, you know, as a team to get things done. So that's what we did. Um, there are definitely some lessons learned in there, and I will share those when we come back around. All right. <clears throat> Great. Thanks so much. So, uh, Michael, going back to you um, um, and your experience at Alvin Ailey, uh, what change did the board go through um, 
the issues that you identified, uh, how did that impact the, the organization? And also knowing the you now, if you could put yourself back into that situation at that time with the knowledge, again, you have today, what might you have done differently? Well, I think the things we changed, number one is we asked 18 of our 36 board members to stay with the organization but leave the board. And of the 18, we had a very nice, I acted, it should have been the chairman, but he was chicken, so I had to do these conversations. Um, 17 of the 18 stayed with the organization. For example, there was one wonderful board member who was the person who had sewn the original costumes for Revelations. If you know the Ailey Company, you know Revelations. Great, passionate, wonderful person. And I asked her to be the archivist of the Ailey organization because this is really where her heart was and it was a better place for her and she was so happy. Um, one person marched off in a huff and turned out to be very, very famous. But, and I think if there's something I would do differently, I wouldn't get him mad. Um, <laughs> So, so we, but we brought on the board 18 new board members who really had a passion for the company and were appropriate governors for that period of time and really added a whole firepower to the organization that we didn't have before. The second thing we did is we put in place an entire marketing campaign. I call it an institutional marketing campaign, meaning it was not aimed at selling tickets for Ailey performances. It was aimed at getting people to understand who we were and that we were the funnest game in town. And that included um, being on the Phil Donahue show. Now, some of you are very young. You don't know who he is, but he was the person before Oprah. Um, <laughs> and we did an hour of the Donahue show. We were in Phil Clinton's first inaugural gala that was on CBS with 88 million viewers. We did a big exhibition about the Ailey Company at the Smithsonian. Um, the city of New York named our street Alvin Ailey Place. We did a big free concert in Central Park that CNN covered and, and, and for t had two minutes every, 20, every half hour for 24 hours, quite an extraordinary amount of time. Um, two books were published about our organization and we did a big, it was our 35th year and we did a big gala with Jesse Norman Algero, Dion Warwick singing Revelations and Denzel Washington and Felicia Rashad were our hosts and Maya Angelou wrote and read a poem. So it was a cast of thousands. Everywhere you turned for 12 months, this was all over 12 months, there was Ailey doing something very potent. And my board, as who I told you before, had never met another human being, all of a sudden had hundreds of friends they wanted to bring into the Ailey family because they went from being embarrassed about our financial health to being excited about our very potent um, campaign in New York City. So that's the second thing, second thing we did. And, and I think the third thing we did was to recognize that we had to open up our arms a bit more and really welcome people into the organization a little better. You can't just show up. We, we were a touring company, and every night we were in a different city, and we were in New York for four weeks, and we were all exhausted by the time we got to New York. And what we realized was just doing great dance and even doing great marketing wasn't enough. We had to also embrace people. And so our board, as they got more and more excited, also got better at welcoming people into their ranks and welcoming people into the organization. And so between having some new strong board members, having a really strong marketing campaign, and doing a better job of welcoming people in, we started a process at the Ailey organization that frankly continues to this day. This, I was there only till 1993. This all happened in 1993. Um, but mostly through the good offices of not myself, but my successor, Sharon Luckman, um, the organization went from strength to strength. And it, it's very exciting um, to note that the Ailey organization has not had a deficit since 1990. That was the last year of deficit for the Ailey organization. They've had a surplus every other year for the last 28 years. And that, that really relates to these three things, building the strength of the board, building the marketing that got everyone inspired, including the board, and then having everyone, including the board, welcome more people into our family. So those are the things that I would say I would want to do, and doing differently, as I said, I wouldn't want to get that one man mad at me, because he's now a TV star. Um, and, and I wish we could have done all this a little quicker, I would say, and gotten to the root of the problem quicker. It took me two years to figure really out what was really wrong, um, and I wish I could have done that a little earlier. So since I assume you won't tell us who that TV star is. I won't. Okay, we will move on to Anne. 
Um, just as you hinted at at the, the end of uh, your story, uh, you know, what cultural change uh, did the board go through? How did that impact the organization? Um, should other organizations seriously consider a cultural shift? Uh, also, what advice would you give them to go through all of that? Um, thank you. We, first of all, I would just want to say generically that there is, I loved your, your comment about um, boards evolving, and I would say that one of the most important things to do is to pick the right board chair for the right time and that there are different board chairs with different strengths required for different eras of your organization's life. And so it's important to not just take the person who thinks they're in line to do the job because they're ready. It's what does the institution need and want, and what the institution needs and wants is at the heart of the culture work that took place at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra because people were in a, a when you, when you have conflict, you settle into what appears to be a turf war, and it isn't about turf. <clears throat> we, are, we are responsible and stewards of an organization that owes mission deliverance to our community. And so this isn't about us. This is about our communities. It's about our organizations thriving in our communities so that we can have impact. So when you begin to realize that it isn't, an, it isn't about you, whatever part of the organization you're in, this is a revelation. And this is the beginning of culture shift. So we talked about behaviors um, influencing attitudes and ultimately getting to agreement on values. And that that was at the heart and soul of our culture work. But we got to that at the end. In the beginning, we hired a consultant to help us figure out how to restructure our board. And because we had a 100-person board and we, let, we, we managed a strike with a 100-person board that stayed completely together. We lost one board member. Um, so that's how strong that board was. But the first thing the board chair said after the strike was, we can't have a 100-person board and govern. This is ridiculous. So he, we hired a consultant, and he said to Paul Hogel and me, um, tell me when it's done. I'll pay for the consultant. I'm not coming to the meetings. Um, but we have to have a smaller board, and we have to have term limits. So would you just like go get that done? We said, OK, um, except we knew that it was a bigger set of questions. And thankfully, our consultant did too. And he said, well, what kind of a culture does this board want to oversee? And he looked into the eyes of the board members. And they really, you know, it was, it was a revelation to even start talking about culture at that time. Uh, so we spent eight months, I think, working on this. And uh, the journey of lots of conversations. And we had a, we had a survey that had everybody answer the question what we thought our organization was to us relative to behaviors and attitudes and values. And then we asked everybody what we wanted it to be. And the bad news was there were th at least three different groups that felt very differently about what we had. But the good news was we all wanted the same thing. So this was visually delivered to us. And so that was the beginning of a journey. How do you get from where you are to where you want to be? And so um, I would just advise everyone to, and I think today is a very different day, 2018 from 2011. The word, you know, saying that culture was the thing that was going to fix everything was, people would tell you that that's nuts. But you can do anything when you are working well together, when you have good relationships. Where you, when you are empathetic, when you are able to face the tough stuff together. And that just doesn't mean a strong board. It means a board that understands its musicians and who listens to its staff and who supports rather than directs. So not top down, but inclusive. And um, I want to call out on Scott Harrison, who's here. <coughs> His very first day of, on the job was the first day of the strike. He came to work at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. And while we were struggling, we were also trying to be aspirational. And we were working on our digital strategy. And so we had a board. We, and all of these committees that we set up were board, musicians, and staff. During the strike, we couldn't have the musicians in the room, which is a real deficit for us, because we needed their thinking. But we had six months to do a lot of work. <laughs> so we did a lot of work. And um, one of the board members, we all talked about a vision. And you talk about vision, you can't do anything without vision. And accessibility 
became the thing that we felt we needed to change. And so Scott was part of, led the committee that worked on um, the, the aspiration that we would become the most accessible orchestra on the planet. And not just in Detroit or in this Michigan or the United States, but on the planet. Because we were talking about the digital space, so we wanted to make sure everybody understood that there were no barriers. So uh, the, my point is that you have to, um, you have to work together. Everything we do at the Detroit Symphony now is about one DSO. We use that as a, as a mantra. It's about the organization and it's about the people we're serving. And we are, you know, our code of working together and our um, care for one another comes before everything else that we do. And it means that we can have difficult conversations and we can have them with respect and um, with care and without the kind of conflict that we lived through. Because what we did agree on, everyone, in 2011, was that we never wanted it to happen again, what had happened to us. That six month period was awful. So the board, again, back to giving them credit, a hundred person board, we resolve. Thankfully, we, we, didn't, we didn't get fired by our board chair. We delivered the goods, term limits, and a smaller board. And um, to our culture, we didn't fire anybody. We had individual conversations with all 100 people, and they self-selected where they belonged. And we had roles and responsibilities very clearly laid out for each one of the groups. And we also had an emeritus group that we that which would elevate the people who had been on the board 50 years. And we had one board member who had been on the board for 50 years. So um, we elevated those people to emeritus and um, we had a self-selection process that took time and produced an outcome that everyone was happy with. And some people didn't pick what I would have picked or Paul would have picked or our board chair would have picked, but. Um, over time, it's worked itself out. And so when you have the time, take the time. When you don't have the time, unfortunately, you just have to push through. Great, thank you, Ann. And uh, Tanetta, just you know, uh, going back to <clears throat> a lot of the uh, steps that you took with Bank One between newsletters and uh, town halls and building website, I'm just really curious, um, you know, what did you learn through that process? What do you think really helped uh, J.P. Morgan Chase to make the adjustments it needed to um, and move forward even stronger? Well, I, you know, so 13, 14 years later, um, you know, I guess you can say the rest is history that in large part um, because of that merger, we became a much stronger um, financial institution um, and, and it's played a great deal in our success that we have today. But um, as you all know, banks in the U.S. have had some issues. Um, I, uh, my team, uh, the communicators, um, I'm sure not just at J.P. Morgan, but at all financial institutions, have gotten really good about being ready um, to communicate about something, um, <laughs> you know, whatever that might be. Uh, there's always something. And so I think there are some, some themes um, or lessons learned, uh, you know, 13 or 14 years ago that are useful today. Uh, and the first one I would say is make sure you have your crisis communications playbook ready. Don't wait until something hits. Have it ready today. Um, you know, think about what are the possible things that could come your way. Um, simulate them. Think about how you would respond to them. Um, make sure that your board understands their roles and responsibilities. You know, the CEO, your ED, your president, whomever get them ready, have a playbook, review it frequently, make sure it's up to date, um, because that will make sure that when something happens, and it always does, you're not caught flat-footed. So that's the first thing. Second thing I would say is, we are now in a very social um, world. Uh, everyone's connected to everyone. And so it's really important that you're honest, um, as honest as you possibly can be, that you face facts, that if you've done something wrong, you, want, you own up to it, because you will be found out um, if you don't, and it's just that much worse. So um, be honest in your communications. Uh, the third thing is communicate, 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 and it's easier to do now. It's also harder to control your narrative, so you wanna make sure that you've got the right people 
out there talking about um, what you need them to talk about. Make sure you're arming your staff with talking points and FAQs because when they leave your office, they're gonna be talking to their neighbors, they're gonna be talking to their friends, they're gonna be talking to their families. You wanna make sure that they are um, giving the narrative that you need them to give to these folks. So you should really make sure that they're trained up um, and use them as your ambassadors. Uh, know who your ambassadors or your influencers are. Nurture those relationships now uh, because when you need them, they will come in handy. It is often better to have a third party tell your story than for you to tell your story or to have that backup. Um, so, you know, start nurturing those relationships today. Also know who your naysayers are um, and be open to the conversation with them. Um, be willing to hear what their concerns are and start crafting how you respond to those now. Don't wait. Um, and, you know, I think I've, I've really used social media to your benefit. If you don't know how to do that, learn. Um, because if you don't learn, someone else is going to use it, and it may not be to your benefit. So um, take advantage of it. And I'd, so those would be like the, you know, the, the six or seven things that I think are transferable and translatable to any organization. Okay, thank you. So we have, <clears throat> we technically have about uh, 10 more minutes. Um, I know that some questions came in onto this magic iPad that's in front of me through something. Um, but I do feel that, um, you know, some of these questions I, I believe were answered pretty well and uh, the experiences that you shared and some of the practical information. Um, I mean, some things that I thought about were just taking the time to build the types of relationships um, with board members and then helping to guide them to uh, do the types of things that you know you really need the organization to do to um, move forward. Um, also, um, you know, spending uh, spending the time to uh, really take a close look at your culture. Um, what is exactly driving um, the people that are around the table um, helping? You know, of course, what are they passionate about? And you know, finding those effective ways uh, to communicate. So. What I want to do at this moment is simply open um, this floor for any questions that you have uh, for our panelists. There's a microphone here in the center of the floor. So if there is a brave soul that wants to stand up, I see a hand. Um, I see a hand back here, yes. Uh, yes. And speak loud if you can or make your way to the microphone. Microphone for better light. I sat in the back for a reason. No, sorry. Hello. Um, this is a question for uh, Mr. Kaiser. A question. Um, I think we're going through a similar um, uh, reformation in our own organization. And in terms of uh, the marketing of the message and who you want to be in the community, how did you find the resource to do that? How did you get the board to buy into the investment in that? And how did you sell that to the community? Great, thank you. If you, I'll go down the list really quickly because it was interesting how we paid for this. Um, the first was the Donahue Show, that was paid for by the Donahue Show. The second was Clinton's inauguration, that was paid by the inaugural, run by a man named Rahm Emanuel, who's become famous since. Um, the third was the exhibition at the Smithsonian, paid for by the Smithsonian. The fourth was a concert in Central Park, that was actually paid for by a corporation. It was our 35th year, it was their 35th year of giving to the arts. I went to them and said, w w let's celebrate together. They paid for that. The New York City paid for the street naming. Um, the publishing company paid for the books, and we made money in the gala. So the net investment was zero. And so what I'm always trying to do is I talk about deciding what an organization's assets are. And by assets, I mean who do you know, which people who are maybe a little bit more famous than you are do you know. And we always say everyone knows someone more famous than they are. Um, what's going on in your city? What events about to happen? What can you um, participate with? We all just have to study what's going on around us. And I find board members are really helpful at doing that. And they enjoy doing that. And we create two or three or four moments a year that are really amazing. But it doesn't have to cost money. It takes a lot of time, but it doesn't necessarily have to take a lot of money. Hi, uh, my name is Maya Stone, and I have a question for Ann and Michael. 
Um, as far as your relationships with like the musicians and the dancers, what did you feel was the most effective communication, either going from the musicians to the board or vice versa? And can you expound on that? So, so I appreciate the questions. Um, there's then and now um, different answers. So then we had, um, in the period of time from the um, report that I read to you in 2008 to the day of the strike, which was two years, we talked and talked and talked. So there were direct meetings, but at that point we were talking as collectives. So it was the union body and it was the board and the staff was facilitating. And um, so it was too late to develop the relationships that I talked about needing. So they didn't have, they had a, they had a very polite relationship. Everybody knew everybody's name. That was about it. I mean, I, that's, that's harsh, but so, um, so, so after the strike and the commitment to relationships became so um, immediate, the board members started inviting, uh, having dinners and inviting musicians into the home and with a handful of staff members and many of those were, were held. Um, the new board chair that, that came on board who happened to be critical leader of the digital task force work as well as the culture and governance task force work. He earned the right to be the board chair and he was, he, culture was his thing. His name is Philip Fisher. Um, he didn't know anything about music and he came to love and has come to love our orchestra. His father's name is on our building and he was doing, he was part of our board for one reason and now he became um, a passionate um, lover, and anyone who knows Philip knows what I mean, a lover of our art form and of the people in the organization. And he showed by example that you could, you could bring love into the workplace and you could talk about that and you could um, have these deep and incredible relationships. And it just set a tone and it, it released um, this energy, this positive energy around relationships. And so today, we are all interested in what everybody else is doing on and off the stage. And we, when we do things together, we volunteer in the community together. We, we, um, go to, we go to concerts that aren't our own concerts and we do that together. We go on tour and we hope that people will, you know, we, board members come and have unbelievable experiences. So we just try to, again, today it's much more organic. Um, we do the work of the organization together, as I said, our, our committees very fully staffed by musicians and board members and staff members, any kind of a committee, regardless of what it is. So um, it becomes organic. At some point it has to probably be intentional before it can become organic and um, leadership, board leadership is critical. I'll just say, because I agree exactly with what Ann said, um, I would say the biggest thing I did to bring board and dancers together at Ailey was to bring board members to rehearsals. Because it's one thing to sit in an audience and to watch this beautiful performance. It's another thing to watch how dancers strive for perfection and, and how hard it is. And, and to be in that room and to watch it happen built an understanding between board, that the board had an understanding for the dancers they didn't have before. Right, we'll try to get to these last two questions. Okay, um, I had a couple questions for Ms. McIntosh. Um, you addressed several practical ways in which- Oh, closer to the, oh. And who are you? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jaleel Smith, um, I'm a musician myself. Uh, I play the bass trombone and I attend Curtis Institute of Music. Curtis. And I wanted to know through this idea of um, working on the end company culture, um, coming from a, um, a company that's in corporate America, as a musician, how can we um, approach our art form in a practical manner? We spend hours in a practice room. Our brains work, you know, very practically, I would hope. And I just, you know, how as a musician can we have this disruptive, positive disruption that can increase the in, uh, I don't know, the in, the in culture within our organizations individually? at school or um, some of the uh, uh, outside organizations that we're all a part of as musicians. How can we, I guess Stanford, you can help with this being a musician yourself. But I, I wanted to ask you that specifically because mm -hmm. well, I Stanford, feel like it was very practical the way you came across. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so I'm not a musician, but, um, and so Stanford, I hope you jump in as well. But I think, you know, sort of what Anne said, and that is 
having those conversations with your organizations, with your fellow musicians, and talking about it, like talking about it to me, you know, is, is half the battle, figuring out what, what your value system is or what you want the culture to be. Um, that's, that's the first, like, that's the first step, in my view, um, is really coming to, a, to an agreement or a consensus with your fellow musicians, with the organizations that you're working with around the culture that you want to be a part of, right? That's how you start building it. And then it's hard work. I mean, you have to not just talk about it, but you also have to live by it. And if you're not actually doing the things that you say are your values, then it's, it's sort of meaningless. So it's also holding each other accountable. Um, you know, for those values once you've decided what you want them to be. The only thing I would add is that, uh, you know, institutions change one person at a time. And very similar to what um, some comments that both Michael and Ann made. It's how do you bring one person along and then get the second one. And then next thing you know, it's, you know, that passion that you have for something I think can live in a different way. So. So thank you Great. for the well, question. You. And we'll try to get to this one last very quick question. Thank you, very brief. Uh, my name is Angelica Durrell, uh, social entrepreneur. And my question is, as a young social entrepreneurs and young social entrepreneurs here in the audience, how do you build and transform a board even when your current network per se is limited to young people or people on the rise? So what? could I do or what could we do? Where should we go to build this uh, evolving and transformative board? I start with those people who come to my work, come to my audience. I, spend, I stand on the steps of every performance, welcoming people in, seeing who comes, finding those who seem the most interested, who come most often, starting a conversation. I find if someone loves your work, it's the greatest starting point for board membership. Um, I, I've <clears throat> recently adopted the concept of boards as owners, and, and you know, at a sports team, the ownership they're at every game. They're they're really all in. Um, they're up in the box. You know, they know the players' names. They're in the locker rooms, and um, that's an amazing relationship. So, so it. But but my Philip story is is a great one because he had not been coming. So we would have missed Philip if we hadn't figured out a different. Um, we hadn't connected with him in a different way. So I think that finding a connection with somebody that you feel or that you see that they feel and taking advantage of whatever spark you see because spark ignites action, right? And so I think it can come in any and all kinds of shapes and sizes and in fact, having a diverse board is really critical. Having a bunch of people that all look the same and come from the same background, really awful. So different people will be on the boards for different reasons, and that's okay. Yeah, just quickly, I also think um, this whole idea of six degrees of se separation is very true, and I think Michael said it. Someone always knows someone more famous than themselves. Um, you just need to mine those relationships. Find out who the folks that are in your orbit know. Meet those people. Find out who they know, and just keep going out, radiating out from, from that point, um, because you will start coming and getting to the right people, um, you know, people that are passionate about whatever you're, you're passionate about that can bring something new to the table or that can introduce you to the next person. But again, it is a lot of work. Right. So I hope that this advice helps you fly like, like an eagle. <laughs> so. <clears throat> you waited the entire session to say that, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Well done. And I'm sorry we're not leaving you much time to fly to your next session, but please help me to give Michael and Tanetta a big round of applause. And well, that eagle's there.